Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. Have you ever wondered how to trust in miracles? We've got a great show for you. Well, good morning, Giants. I sound like a 90-year-old smoker. I feel like I should have like one of those buttons you push. My, <laughs> I've got a little something, hello. something. And, yeah, hello. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not the Delta variant. Yeah. I'll take any other variant. But uh, so here I am on go, go the chart. interwebs. Yeah. On <laughs> loading, the up, loading up with uh, emergency and my juice plus and all the good stuff that will help me feel better. And my energy drink. So you, go. you gotta have yeah. those in the morning. Hey, uh, if you haven't subscribed on YouTube, go ahead and do that. Ding the bell, as they say, and uh, then you get all the alerts and and stuff like that. Because uh, Facebook blocked us for another few days. Uh, I can stream on my personal account. So if you want to go see Facebook on Ryan Morris's personal account, do it. You can see Wake Up with Giants. It's Otherwise, all other things, and you can see other things too. <laughs> it's all appropriate. So that's the good news. Um, yeah, uh, or if you want to come over to a tribe of giants on Facebook, we've got a community of uh, somewhere currently around 4,000 engaged individuals that uh, are wanting to make the world a better place and help themselves and help others. So a tribe of giants on Facebook. And uh, Nick, do you have anything else that uh, you want to share with? Oh, no, I thought that was audience? phenomenal. Um, we've Thanks, got it man. coming up this Thursday. You have a great smoker voice. <laughs> I like it. That's a raspy. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so Thursday night, we're doing an event at uh, 9, well, 7.30 p.m. Mountain. And so we'll be going over the 12 journeys and then also the uh, the new tree of change. So Sweet. we'll dive into that. And so how you can change your life in four weeks is what the topic is. And so let's uh, let's dive into talking about our most important person on the show, Yes, uh, Ryan Morris. No, I no. <laughs> Sarah Smith. She's got an awesome last name. I kind of like it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, she, she's a mom. She's an artist, an author. Uh, she wrote a book with her mom, Rachel Smart. Uh, it's a Christian autobiography titled Modern Day Miracles. And Sarah is a large brain tumor survivor. She's going to share her story with us today, defying medical odds and her journey through faith. And I'm excited to dive in and really kind of go through the entire journey, kind of what laid the foundation for all of this and what was your experience through it? Do you care if we go back in time? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here with the guys who are changing the world. You two are on fire. <laughs> thank you. And I love that shirt. Sure uh, that thank you. Yeah. I'm a giant. Yes. My path um, is not straight, right? Free hugs. <laughs> Yeah, so going back in time, I grew up in a beautiful suburb south of Atlanta, Georgia. ATO, uh, I had loving, supportive parents and three amazing sisters. We enjoyed home-cooked meals together, family bike rides, jumping on the trampoline, which included both my parents because they were yeah. both active and young at heart. We took fun trips to Disney World, and I saw that, Nick, you just came back from Disneyland recently with your daughter. I did, yeah. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> so much fun. I had a dream childhood. Our home was Christ-centered. We read scriptures before bed and prayed together. After prayer, we would all huddle in a circle, put our hands together, and in unison say, sure, love ya. <laughs> That's awesome. Life, life was picture perfect until... Huh. I was eight years old. My parents sat my sisters and I down on the couch one day and explained that my dad, my hero and protector, had terminal cancer and didn't have very long to live, about six months. Everybody in my family reacted differently to the news. I was a scared little girl. I didn't want to hear that my daddy was really sick. I tuned it out and didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to be alone. So I went to my bedroom 
and started organizing my closet and dresser drawers. I numbed my pain by distracting myself with daily activities. And as the months went by, I never went through the classic stages of grief. I got stuck on the first step, shock and denial. I never believed that my superhero type dad was actually going to die. Whenever anyone would ask me about my dad or how I was doing, I would say, oh, fine, and quickly change the subject. Running away from reality by ignoring and suppressing uncomfortable feelings was how I protected my heart, but it had harmful repercussions. By not processing my emotions, it manifested in a variety of ways. Yeah. So let's, can we pause right there? I want to, I want to dive into that. Uh, the, the grief process, we talk about this in our, in our journeys and the importance of it. And at eight years old, I think of my daughter, she's, uh, my youngest is nine, right? If I were to pass away, how would my kids, each one process that if that were to occur? And, um, the, the idea of getting stuck in that, that cycle, if you can dive into this a little bit of shock and denial, Right. Uh, Susan Anderson talks about in her work of the uh, shattering and the withdrawal and internalization, you know, and it's almost like, what could I have done different? But even there, it's that shock and denial is is almost a cycle of not even getting that far. It's like, no, nah, this isn't happening. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Exactly. Well, as eight years old, feeling shocked, it created a shock to my body, not just yeah. my mind, but my body. Yeah. Johns Hopkins Medical School states that 70% of disease is psychosomatic, meaning the majority of illness starts in our minds. Okay, man. So keep going. How, how did that impact you then? So two years later, I was 10 years old and noticed that I couldn't balance very well in gymnastics. Jeez. Six <laughs> years later, I suddenly lost hearing in my right ear. It was summertime. I was swimming a lot to try to distract myself once again from losing my dad who had passed away several months earlier. So he got six months to live or he was you know, given six months to live and he got eight miraculous years mm -hmm. that were wonderful, full of memories. So I was a hurting 16 year old teenager. I liked swimming. It was quiet under the water and I felt safe like I was in my own little world. Naturally, I assumed water from the pool got stuck in my ear. That's what it felt like. I tried yawning to pop my ears, shaking my head to get the water out. I even tried sleeping on my right side at night to allow the water to drain. Nothing worked. My mom set up an appointment with an ear doctor and after examining my ear and giving me a hearing test, the audiologist said, it's not water. You are 100% deaf in your right ear. Wow. The causes for sudden hearing loss are still unclear. You are so young and healthy. It's most likely a virus. Hmm. I looked over at my mom feeling shocked and scared, imagining a virus spreading to my left ear and going completely deaf and having to learn sign language. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine I'm only 16 years old? The doctor prescribed a steroid medication to treat the virus and try to get my hearing back. After two months of bone pain, weight gain, and a swollen face, I still couldn't hear anything out of my right ear. I was devastated. I never thought to question a doctor, get a second opinion, or explore the problem further by doing my own research about sudden hearing loss. I was only 16 years old. I just continued on with my life. I was a junior in high school. The school year began hanging out with my friends and figuring out what to wear to school was what I was used to worrying about, not sudden deafness. I became very self-conscious of my new disability and dreaded social situations. I blushed whenever anyone would say something and I couldn't hear them. I had to ask them to repeat themselves. I was also embarrassed by my sudden weight gain uh, from the steroid medication. Have you two ever known anybody who had to take steroids, not for weightlifting, no, um, but for medical these, reasons? These guns are natural. <laughs> <laughs> 
but my face was so swollen. It was like so big. And people yeah, looked wow. at me like they wondered what happened to me over the summer. They probably just assumed I ate too much. <laughs> uh, one insensitive person asked me if I was pregnant. Life 101, never ask a girl if she's pregnant without that girl telling you she's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've learned that and and not, you don't ask their age either. Have you or done that? I, Shame on you. No, no, I haven't done that. I just oh, watched somebody else do that. I'm like, nope, not, not doing that. Um, I'm not going to be like that guy. Don't, don't ask a guy if he's pregnant either. That's yeah. Hurt. That's yeah, really not awkward. Not yeah. Um, walking in the crowded hallways at school was frustrating because if a friend was walking on my bad side, my right side, it was all muffled. So I had yeah. to run around to the other side so I could hear her. I couldn't tell direction of sound anymore. So when someone called my name in class, I sheepishly looked all around the room to figure out where the noise was coming from. Driving was difficult. If someone gave me directions or said something in the passenger seat, couldn't hear them very well. And I didn't want to keep turning my head and try, try to read their lips when I was supposed to be looking straight ahead at the road. Being hyper alert in social situations to avoid awkwardness was exhausting. I was always looking around to try to be aware of my surroundings. I try to try to arrive early to places so I could seat myself appropriately. Connecting the dots in half her conversations was rough. Wow. Yeah. As you, you know can imagine. I, <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. I hang on to that because last night I'm I'm coming out to my brother's house. It's on a dirt road, crazy, crazy dirt road, like long. And his daughters are driving in front of us and the truck is just throwing off dust. And I, I literally can't see. And I'm trying to connect the dots, like just making a connection here, just driving blind, you know, and I can, I felt some frustration around just not being able to see like these things we're so used to, right. I can imagine not being able to hear and connecting those dots, how that might feel. Yes. That frustration. The sudden change. I mean, it was overnight. That yeah, I had wow. to, I had, I was, it was necessary for me to adapt. Yeah. But as you can imagine with all these dis disabilities and these um, difficulties, I, I just went inside. I distanced myself from people, yeah. uh, including my friends. It was easier than having to try to listen so hard and feel embarrassed all the time. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Did you, uh, did you isolate a little bit? I mean, <clears throat> so you separated from your friends, you went inside, but did you just pull back completely? I did. I mean, family, you have, you're living around your family and, you know, right. um, but I remember in the hallway, like if my best friend was walking toward me and if she didn't see me yet, I mean, I wasn't a rude person. So if she saw me, I'd walk yeah. up and, <laughs> but if she didn't yeah. see me yet, I'd kind of like duck and go to the bathroom and wait till she like passed. Oh, so people probably assumed, you know, they're like, what happened to Sarah? I thought she, she, you know, I would, they'd invite me to parties and I'm like, oh, my stomach hurt oh, next time. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Keep, keep going. What? What happened? So uh, after schools, um, after school, I took long walks alone to contemplate life. Being outside, surrounded by big, beautiful trees and fresh air was healing. Being in nature, appreciating all the creations naturally opened up my heart to the creator. I could sense that God was very aware of me and loved me deeply and personally. This was so comforting. Uh, for all the changes that I was going through. And he became, became my friend and began teaching me how to trust him. So after graduating from high school, I wanted to share God's love with others. Despite my physical and social disability, I stepped out of my comfort zone and served a mission for my church. On my mission, I got headaches and they weren't typical headaches where you could rub your temples and take Tylenol for it to go away. My headaches felt like a constant dull ache in the back of my head that got worse when I sneezed, bent over to pick something out, up, it just throbbed. So I'd place my hand on the back of my head, take a few deep breaths and the pain would dissipate. Hmm. So I got used to sucking it up. On a mission, you're working hard, you're tired. I didn't want to complain and be a burden to those around me. I also experienced occasional facial twitches, which I brushed off as simply a symptom of stress. 
I had to learn Spanish on my mission and I struggled <laughs> remembering the vocabulary and grammar rules. Have you two ever had to learn a new language? Yeah, hablo español. Yeah, see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hablo uh, muy bien, pero es difícil. Yes, muy difícil. Right, right. And yes. Do you know Just, any Spanish? What, what I like to do is speak Spanish and then throw somebody's name in. Just random. <laughs> They don't know what it's about, just and then they think you're talking about. Donde them. está la biblioteca? <laughs> la biblioteca. Where do you hide all the books? Yeah. <laughs> That's um, funny. So I pressed forward for 18 months, and I tried my yeah. best, but it was yeah. still super hard. And um, God helped me to be able to communicate, though, and help others feel His love for them, which was my heart's desire. I met wonderful people and had incredible life-changing experiences. Over time, I adapted to my hearing loss. I still struggled, but it wasn't so challenging. I made new friends and had fun being social again. After my mission, I attended college and studied business for the first semester. Then I felt a sudden impression that I needed to switch my major to Spanish education. After struggling so bad on my mission, I'm like, anything but Spanish. I mean, I would have done automotive engineering and that's not my forte. Uh, I looked up, I went on the, the website and the academic catalog just to see what classes I would have to take to graduate. And I was completely overwhelmed. Literature classes in English were so hard for me to, you know, read these thick books and take tests on it. I'm like, I can't remember. <laughs> but to do that in Spanish felt impossible. I knew though that it was God's will for me. The feeling was overwhelmingly strong. I took a deep breath, walked to the academic advising center and told them I wanted to switch my major. Semester after semester, God carried me. He helped me study. He helped me pass my test. Miraculously, I completed all my college courses and was given the option to do my student teaching in a different state. I prayed asking which state I should go to and I felt strongly that I needed to be in Arizona. I never lived in Arizona before, and I was single at the time, so I thought maybe the reason why I felt so strongly to go there was because I was gonna meet a good-looking guy and get married. I was excited. <laughs> While student teaching in Arizona, my uncle who lived there told me about a hearing device that helped people like me with single-sided deafness. It was new. I was curious about it, so I went to check it out. The ear doctor was very thorough and gave me an MRI or an X-ray of my brain and inner ears as a prerequisite before getting fitted for this special hearing aid. I wasn't nervous about the MRI. MRI. I never got one before, but I was just focused on how being able to hear better would make my life so much easier, especially as a teacher. The next week, I felt a sudden sense of urgency that I needed to hurry up and get my binder finished early for student teaching. There's a requirements that you have to do, lesson plans, observations. The teacher who is observing you has to sign off on a few things. I finished everything two months before it was due. The next week was my 25th birthday. I felt on top of the world. I just finished my student teaching requirements. I was making new friends, feeling more confident. I wonder where I would land my first teaching job. I still remember blowing out the candles on my birthday cake, wishing and hoping for a wonderful mm -hmm. upcoming year. The day after my birthday was a bright and sunny day in Phoenix, Arizona. After teaching at school, I drove over to the ear doctor for the follow-up appointment. I walk in excited. The receptionist mistakenly hands me my MRI report. I thought it was like the receipt of the copay or something, so I just grab it, put my purse down, sit down <clears throat> all by myself in the waiting room. No one was also in there. And I read the first line. There is a large enhancing mass on the right posterior part of the brain. I didn't understand it, so I read it again slowly. There is a large enhancing mass on the right posterior part of the brain. I looked up to see if my name was on the paper, assuming I was reading a different patient's report. I touched the back of my head and slowly slid my hand to my ear. I felt hot and sick. 
The doctor stood at the door and called my name. I followed him down the hallway and he had horrible bedside manners. As we were walking, he turned to me and said, you have a tumor and it's big. <laughs> None of this, sit down, what, can I get you a glass of water? Yeah, Would you like wow. the bad news or the good news first? No, what a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> he then turned on his computer to show me my MRI scan, and this is what I saw. Whoa. Wow. Holy cow. He traced my gigantic tumor with his finger. Blood drained from my face. I felt dizzy and started sweating. I asked him, am I going to die? He said, if you don't get surgery soon, then yes, you will die. What a jerk. Uh, he also didn't bother to mention that my tumor was not cancerous until the very end of our appointment. So I was sitting there assuming oh, my tumor yeah. was cancerous because that's just what I knew. Um, and my dad died of cancer. So I'm just sitting there thinking I'm dying while he was so fascinated by the size of my tumor. He kept zooming in and saying, I've never seen one so big before. It's huge. Holy oh, cow. Holy cow. I was livid. I stormed out of that office. I didn't even bother to check out. I didn't want to look the receptionist in the eyes who handed me my MRI report. I sat all alone in the car and wept in the parking lot. Yeah, let me let me pause for a minute here. I really want to hear, you know, going into the emotion of this. I appreciate you sharing this. Um, it sounds like you've got a really phenomenal script around it. I really want to dive into you at this point and and talk more about that. I mean, your dad passed at six, was it 16 when he 16. passed away? Mm -hmm. And how old are, are you when this is happening again? 25. 25. Yeah, the day after my birthday. So you Happy have, birthday yeah, to me. <laughs> yeah, the history of that. And you're just sitting with that, just kind of left to yourself with this whole new realization, like, wow, I, I could die, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Talk to me about that. Like, what's Once going again, on I was in yeah. shock. <clears throat> So my, my brain was fuzzy. I wasn't thinking yeah. clearly when you're yeah. in that kind of state, you're just sweating, your heart's pounding. It just, it needs, you need a day or yeah. <laughs> an hour to process. So right at that initial time, my brain felt foggy. I felt hot. Um, I didn't know what to do. My hands were shaking. Um, yeah, I want to, I want to hit on yeah. this. This is where I think we have some gold here to dig up a little bit. And I imagine people run into something, anything. I, I saw AJ's on here, you know, paralyzed in a car accident. And that shock of my life's not going to be the same. Or it could not be the same. There's potential it won't be the same, right? And you, you go into that shock. And now instead of it being out there, somebody else, it's you. Yeah. And so I'm wondering within that, talking about the experience, the experience is going to be pretty similar for most people. You have something change in your life, whatever it is, it's going to for shock you. Yep. And you're going to have this space where you're going to pull back. And just like you did, you, you get away from that situation and you go away from it and you go start reflecting, right? Yep. And you start internalizing, you start thinking about all this stuff. And um, what I want to know, you said you got angry. Yeah. Is, it, is that Sarah's angry? angry. Sarah's no. angry. I, I mean, I can just yeah. I, I can know, be angry, right? I know her mom. <laughs> I can, I'm just right. like, it's like a normal walking out of the doctor's office for everyone else. But to her, oh, it's no, like, I stormed and I gave that reception. <laughs> you lie. I stormed. I stormed lifted. so hard. She's just walking out. <laughs> So as, as you as you go through that process, that's what Susan Anderson talks about in her work is you go through the shattering withdrawal, the internalization, the rage, and then there's this lifting. And, and under research, they talk about denial and anger and uh, bargaining and depression and acceptance, right? And I'd imagine you experienced all of that. All of it. All of it. And yeah. so for those that are watching, what can you share with them around how to manage that because you have a shock to your system in some form how did you manage it talk talk to me about that like how did you process it um kind of just from the cuff here a little bit yeah does that work i just did a lot of reflecting 
Yeah. Um, first my brain was foggy, um, yeah. Yeah. but I just sat in the car. I knew I wasn't safe to drive. Yeah. Um, I didn't have anywhere I needed to be. My mom was in Georgia. Uh, my roommates were probably making dinner or something. Um, I just felt so scared. I didn't know what to think or what to do. I started reflecting, thinking about when I was 10 and I couldn't balance very well in gymnastics. Like you're connecting all the dots. All, yeah, everything's they're, making oh sense God. now. Yeah, yeah, slowly. And I'm sitting yeah. in that in my car. I thought when I was 16 and I couldn't hear anything. I thought about all the headaches on my mission and trouble learning Spanish and wow. remembering oh. things in college. The tumor had been growing in my head the whole time mm. for over 15 years. Wow, 15 years. So I, I imagine with that, that connecting all the dots, it, there's this closure in a way of, oh, it all makes sense now. And it all then, makes sense, but it's almost a little more scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this yeah. loss, right? There's this loss of all of those experiences too, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? I had seen doctors through those years because I knew yeah. something was wrong, but all my blood tests coming kept coming back normal. Huh. So the doctors probably thought it was all in my head, which it was all in my head. <laughs> uh, that's a play. That's a play on the words there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unbelievable. I um, felt I was angry at God. I felt yeah. abandoned by him. Where were okay. you? You prompted me to do all these things. Where were you? Yeah. I felt very alone. Yeah. 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 Keep going. Keep going. I, with your story. Yeah. I sure. knew that I needed to call my mom because she was waiting to hear how the appointment went so she could pay for the hearing device for my birthday yeah. present. So I got up the courage, called her. Finally, um, she answered and she went silent to try to comprehend what I was telling her. And then we both went quiet. I was so angry. The day before was my birthday. And then in a second, my life flipped upside down. I can imagine your mom's feeling some of the same emotions because she's lost her husband, right? And yep. now maybe going through it again with her daughter. Like, uh, I can understand going silent and, and thinking about all of the things that yeah, yeah could come up. And she was asking me all these questions after she was silent, she was trying to catch up like, oh my gosh, you're yeah, hearing yeah. and then your headaches. Oh my gosh, it's all coming together. And she was asking me questions like, well, how big is yeah. it? Everything was so blurry with the appointment. So I was like, well, he didn't say it was cancerous, but it's really big. And he said it's on a really bad place in my brain. I was just trying to like tell her, but she said that she would take a red eye flight to be with me. The next day we met with a top neurosurgeon, Dr. Randall Porter at Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He turned on his computer to show us the MRI. I had already seen it, my mom hadn't. She was so shocked by how big it was. He said, you have an acoustic neuroma, a rare, slow growing benign tumor that grows on the nerve connecting the inner ear to the brain. Wow. Your acoustic neuroma has grown so much that it's putting tremendous pressure on your brain stem, significantly displacing it. So the brain stem goes up the middle of the brain here. And this is my ear. This is where the tumor started. It grew, 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 grew. And it's pushing it out. Holy cow. He couldn't believe that I didn't have more serious symptoms considering the brain stem controls everything in the body. I told him to be honest and straight with me with what we were dealing with. He said, well, acoustic neuromas have three categories, small, medium, and large. Yours is twice the size of a typical large. And uh, it's on a very, very critical part in your brain, right there on the brain stem. So your gigantic size, the asymmetrical shape and the location makes this surgery complicated. It frankly doesn't get more serious than this. Mm. I will have to shave the side of your head and make a big incision in order to get the tumor out. Uh, the surgery will last three days. The first day oh. I will go in for 12 hours to get us, you know, to try to remove it very, very carefully because anything can go wrong in brain surgery and try to get close to the brain stem. The second day, I will allow your brain to relax and move back in place. 
And the third day, I will go in for another 10 hours and try to get as close to the brainstem as possible. <clears throat> I asked him what the complications were, what the risks were. And he took a deep breath and said, with your size of tumor and the location, it's not looking so good. Mm. He said, uh, you could have a stroke, coma, brain damage, blurry vision, double vision, infections. Um, you could have severe balance issues, needing a walker or wheelchair. Um, you may have trouble breathing, needing a tracheostomy. Um, you could have swallow problems, needing a feeding tube. And you will have definite facial paralysis. You know, have you seen those people that yeah, have like a droop yeah. on one side? Yeah. Your tumor has been stretching out your right facial muscles for over 15 years. So when we remove that tumor, your facial muscles will be weak and your face will droop. Small acoustic neuroma tumors cause facial paralysis and yours is the largest I've ever seen. I am so sorry. I looked the doctor straight in the eyes and said, just pull the plug. Who wants to live like that with all those disabilities? I cried myself to sleep that night, feeling abandoned by God. I was filled with panic as I realized I had zero control of my life. I woke up with a headache and felt like staying in my bed with the covers pulled over my head. I didn't want to face the world. I didn't want to face reality. My mom encouraged me to get up and pray with her. I wept as I prayed, begging God for comfort. I needed hope. I needed serious rescuing. I picked up my Bible and randomly flipped open to Psalm, and my eyes caught hold upon uh, chapter 70, verse 4, that says, Let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. I sat there pondering that verse, thinking, what, what did that mean? Let God be magnified. And what did that look like for my specific situation? I realized I had two choices to make. I could either lock myself in my bedroom, being paralyzed by fear, continue to wallow in self-pity, be mad at the ear doctor who never gave me an MRI when I was 16, or I could start believing in a miracle those four words, let God be magnified, created a space for my mind to pause and breathe so I could then look up and focus my attention on someone bigger than myself. It became my anchor when my world was spinning out of control. It reframed my perspective from viewing my diagnosis as my final uncontrollable fate and drowning in my sad looking future to seeing my situation as God's opportunity to show himself. So in your book, The Giants and the Smalls, which I love, I read to my six month old son. Mm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in this situation, I could have been a small yeah. and focused <clears throat> on my problems and all the complications of surgery, or I could choose to be a giant and see an opportunity. Yeah, well. Can I can I enter yes inter, introspect and in, interject something, you know I just uh, this week something came up for me around depression you know uh, I was researching it put it into a program I'll be teaching on it on Thursday, um, but there's four there's power in depression, you know it, it's it's something that we look at and we don't want to experience because that depression can feel really heavy a lot of people end up taking their lives during depression. Yeah. And depression is one of those things that helps us to move away from our old life and something that once was. Mm -hmm. And so it gives us an opportunity to retreat, right? To reflect, to re-engage and to rejoice actually, because if we didn't go through depression, we, we wouldn't, if, if it never felt bad, if it never felt sad, we wouldn't move away from it. Yeah. Right. And, and the life that you knew had the potential of changing 
Well, it was already here. Here's the crazy thing is the life that you knew actually got better after the experience because the light you had gone through the struggle of losing all those things prior to that. It's almost like a backward illness in a way. Because I, yeah. I, I know where you are today, and I don't yeah. want to spoil the message here, but my life was restored. Yes, more <laughs> abundantly for sure. But the depression is one of those things that we look at and we, we don't want to experience it, but it's actually a useful tool. It's one of those things that really helps us navigate some of the loss and the grief because without it, we wouldn't bounce back. Yeah. And so it's actually a very useful tool. The stages of grief, depression, like you talked about, yeah. uh, anger, uh, bargaining, the, a bargaining. The yeah. Yeah, yeah, all those. It was compressed. Grieving my diagnosis was compressed to only yeah. a week and a half. Wow. So when I was eight years old, I didn't even go through any of the stages of grief, just got stuck on the first one, didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. Grieving my diagnosis was miraculously compressed um, because it needed to be that way. I'm so grateful that my mom was was with me. For anyone who knows my mom, Rachel Smart, knows that she is the bravest, most resilient bull rider who ever lived. <laughs> my mom's uh, fighter spirit ignited my own. She pulled me out of the ditch and guided me toward the light. Yeah. She helped me step away from thinking about all the uncertainties of how the surgery was going to go and which complications I would have and instead focus my attention on what I was certain about. Do you want to say something, Ryan? No, I don't. Ryan does. <laughs> I absolutely. I'm just sitting here thinking about, I don't know, the, the, uh, like your mom and I, I know your mom a lot better than I know you. And so I'm, I'm loving getting to know you. But she, like you are just, it's so easy to see your mom and you and you and your mom and the family connection and the type of people that you are, even going through the hard, the, the amount of positivity still and the, the amount of knowing who, who you are, where you came from, why you're here, where you're going, the hope, the, 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 um, it's, it's inspirational because so many people could could have these things happen and and even though you had the the moments of the woe is me the uh, you know the anger the fear the frustrations those things come they're gonna come to everybody it's what you did with those things that's just that's getting me well, thank that, you. I'm, I'm looking I'm thinking about my life and going huh like I didn't have to do that. Like, you know, it, it brings in gr new gratitude. It brings in um, empathy and love um, for other people that have things that, that are, that, um, that may be harder, that, that may be the, uh, um, something that uh, I'm grateful that a, I don't have to go through that. And maybe, maybe I'll never will. And I hope I never will, but um grateful for those that do and then their attitude and what they do from that point yeah and they're, they're they might not they might not be as as uh, as um their lives might end sooner they might not uh get to experience much more of life but um grateful for those people that have those experiences and then and then are able to um grow and then share with other people of, of what you could do even inside of all of those hard things. Um, some people don't get the opportunity. They, their, their lives end very quickly. They find out they might have something like this and, and it's over in a matter of days. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, inside of that, it makes me grateful for the time that I, that I do have. And um, thinking back on, man, how much time have I wasted? Um, what can I do more in a, in, in a day to, um, not waste the time or be grateful for the time or, or share my talents with others. And I, I know for a fact that you're doing that just being on the show and helping others to know that, uh, like there is hope and you can adapt inside of, of these challenges. 
um, and tell the people that you're, you're around that you love them and yeah. uh, that you're grateful for them because you don't, you don't know. We, none of us know it could, it could all be over tomorrow. So, or today. It's very instant. true. Sarah, can I ask you something? So you got this yeah. shirt on, right? Yeah. Why, why that shirt? What spoke to you about that shirt? Well, first I need a new workout shirt. <laughs> so I went on your website. Yeah. I am a giant. I loved the tree. Yeah. Um, it says, my path is not straight, uh, written right here. And I, I've always loved trees. Remember on those walks yeah. when I was 16, being surrounded yeah, by the big, yeah. beautiful trees. I've always had a love with, with trees. Um, but all of our life experiences, they can bring us to wholeness and healing. Yeah. Um, in this group, the tribe of giants, there are a lot of different kinds of people with different beliefs and values, yeah. um, that can help you resonate with your most authentic self. Yeah. So that's why I liked I, this I shirt. That. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, that the, the distinctions, this will take us off course a little bit, but I'll bring it back. I promise. Uh, the differences, you know, there's so many different trees. All are beautiful, right? They they sing in harmony together with their differences. Yeah. Um, your paths, our paths are all different, you know, and they're harmonious in a way. Yeah. Um, some of them feel conflicting, but they're they're not. You know, I look at uh, your path and what you've gone through. I never I never had to do that either. You got my nose is running, my eyes are running, you know, <laughs> just watering. Um, but I just think each of us has our own path. It's unique. And so to compare yourself to anybody else denies, denies the beauty that you already are, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that, like, uh, if that brings something up for you. Yeah. Like you, both you and Ryan were talking about everybody experiences different things. Nobody yeah. goes through this life escaped from challenges. Yeah. Um, whether that's a divorce, uh, losing your job, uh, a sudden disability, whatever, whatever you're dealing with, infertility, um, yeah. life is hard, but God is good. And there's always, there's always hope. Uh, yeah. maybe not right when you, right when it happens, your glasses are kind of fogged up, but then, um, with time and healing and introspection, it can clear out away and help you see with a different perspective. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So the part of the reason why I share my story is not so you can learn about me, but so that you can learn more about yourself to take a closer look at the patterns in your life and inspire your own healing journey, whatever that may look like. Yeah. And expect this is something I'm learning. Whether you believe in a God or not, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Miracles occur mm -hmm. consistently. You know, here's here's something that's random but ryan says you know what are the odds of that surprisingly low right ridiculously low and surprisingly high i think is what you say something along those lines um you know we had an experience this week my daughter was supposed to be married on tuesday her her uh, fiance had an appendicitis he ruptured appendix and so he went to the hospital for three days so no no wedding well, the wedding ring that he was using was his grandfather's, who also ruptured his appendix on his wedding day years and years ago. Like, this is something totally unconnected, but it's it's like, what are the odds of something like that occurring? What are the odds of your tumor healing? You know, all these things. There are things that we can't explain. That's a miracle. I mean, I would I would ask you, actually, instead of me defining a miracle, what do you define as a miracle? Now, I'm sharing experiences here, but what yeah. would you say a miracle is? I would say a miracle is opening up the door of possibility for God to perform his will. A.J. Hunt just um, shared a comment with us and yeah. asked, how do you reconcile the miracle of your healing versus the apparent lack of a miracle in your father's death? How, how does that inform your view of God? Excellent question. Thank mm. you for asking that. Um, one plus two does not always equal three in miracle land. Just because you pray your heart out, do all the right things, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, there can be miracles, just as much of a miracle along the way, um, 
than with it being exactly outlined exactly how you wanted it to be. Uh, my dad, we prayed our hearts out for those eight years and we saw miracles upon miracles and that's for a different show. Um, but we saw God's hand during that. He didn't just close his eyes. He was there helping our family and our family grieved and processed through that, through those eight years. And also after, well, I didn't really grieve <laughs> until later, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, that was a miracle. It brought our family close together. My mom and I, we wrote a book. We were able to reconcile a difficult relationship. Um, miracles are miracles and one plus two doesn't always equal three. That's just what I want to say about no, that. I like that. And, and recognizing, recognizing them is part of the miracle. Yeah. Right. I also think that either, either because of those experiences that happened, um, good and bad, um, you are the sum total of all of those things. Your mom yeah, is the yeah. sum total of all of those. some of the greatest people I know and the miracle inside of that of of going through that is you being able to share with other people um, the love of your dad and the experiences of your dad and 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 maybe get through some of those things a little bit easier because you had been through those things and then having your dad with you even though he's not with you yeah. um, it's pretty powerful you know and 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 I just I I want to thank you for um, <laughs> oh, for being who you are. You and your mom, your your whole family. Uh, I would imagine I, I view them all the same as as the most amazing people on planet Earth. <laughs> the hearts of gold. You, I don't even know them all, and I'm sure that every single one of them is just absolute gold. Um, and so um, thank you. Because of because of your of your mom and your dad, uh, you're here with us, and and then all of your experiences, um, you're amazing. So thank you. Thank you. That's I like miracle. to think of it like a tree, uh, yeah. just because you know yeah. there's a scar on a tree. Uh, the tree has been through things. Maybe um, one limb broke off or whatever. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, dismiss the miracle of the growth of the tree. Um, just because life knocks you down, you can get back up stronger than you were before. Uh, a tree, the roots grow when there's, when there's wind, when there is um, adversity, and it becomes a stronger tree through that uh, resistance. This is the thought that just came up with that. You know, a crooked, a crooked tree still produces fruit. All of us, we think we might be a little wonky, maybe not all of us, but we might be a little wonky, but there's still something to produce in this world, something, our unique thing. Um, there, there's this idea that we all have to do it the same way, and that's that's just not human nature. I was reading about brains around Einstein's brain and, and how he had some things within his brain that were really similar to most humans. There were a few things that were different. But it was that uniqueness that that created him the way that he was. It was that subtle difference, right? It created a vast change. It's like an airplane. If it's off course by even a, a degree, it'll be miles and miles away from the airport or its target, which is the beauty, beauty of life because subtle differences like that in each of us create uniqueness. And so I, I love the idea, you know, that, that my path is not straight that I go about my goals like a tree, crooked and bifurcated and scarred up and all this stuff, but I still produce fruit. You know, if people could think like that, you're a tree, be, be like a tree. Mm -hmm. I love that. What comes up for you as you hear that? Um, just all the, I'm looking out the window right now at all the beautiful yeah, yeah. trees and they're all so different and lovely in their own unique way. And so instead of comparing, you know, why did she get a miracle or I didn't, or um, if only I had enough faith, as much faith as her or my, I'm not as beautiful as so-and-so, uh, yeah. just being strong within your own, with your own self and um, confident that God made you who you are and uh, gave you your experiences so that you can continue to grow and uh, bear fruit, uh, help other people along their path. Let me, let me ask you this. If you were to share a piece of wisdom with us, you know, going 
back to yourself before all of this had occurred, if you could share something with yourself back then, what would you have shared? I would have wrapped my arms around my inner child and told little Sarah that she's safe, Hmm. safe to hear, safe to feel her emotions. Pain and grief, although uncomfortable, are necessary teachers for growth and transformation. Uh, Ryan, what comes up as you hear that? Um, I would probably say that same thing is going yeah. back to my younger self and saying that you're you are safe. That's excellent advice. It's okay. You're loved. Um, knowing that now, but knowing that before would have would have uh, made things a little bit like easier. And. Uh, so that's excellent. I think that's excellent advice. This is a this is a solemn uh, video that we've done. You know, it's beautiful because the message here is that, I mean, whatever you're going through, there can be purpose in it. But we kind of get to decide what that purpose is, right? Because I'm listening to um, uh, Victor Frankl's newest book, Yes to Life. Who knew he wrote another book after he died, but it it came out. Yes to life. Beautiful book talks about saying yes to what we have and creating purpose within that. And no matter what you're going through, whether you're AJ and, and you're in a wheelchair or you go through a tumor or you're going through depression or divorce or whatever it is, say yes to life. Just say yes and stay in the game and choose and create a purpose around that. Um, if you were to define one of your purposes, and I'd imagine you have a few, I'm going to plug that in there. What would your purpose be? My first one is to love <laughs> those around me. Yeah. Um, but I feel like God saved my life for me to share my story. Hmm. So thank you for having me on. Um, yeah. Like I said before, not to share my stories, so you know, all about me, but to help you. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Is there, is there something else you want to talk about? Anything you want to venture down or explore? Or uh, well, we can just, yeah. yeah, keep going to the surgery. Yeah, um, let's do it. So I, I like we're wrapping up. I guess we should. Yeah, we'll the, wrap it up real part. quick. Yeah. But it's like, what happened? <laughs> and then, I don't even realize. Like, I'm so episode. off track. I don't even realize. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Take as much time as you need. No, go you're back, fine. I'll, I'll condense it. Yeah. No, so, um. Beliefs from my childhood, they flooded my mind. You know, we always read scriptures together at night. And I remember God helped Moses. He gave him power to part the Red Sea. Uh, God protected Daniel from the lions. Jesus fed a multitude of 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fishes. Holding on to truths such as these um, filled my mind with so much um, clarity that God could do the impossible. And uh, I read powerful scriptures to prepare for battle. Uh, Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You only need be still. Joshua 1, 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper. I thought about um, my dad was only given... six months to live and got eight years. I thought about how God carried me um, on my mission with the giant brain tumor, um, how he carried me to college graduation with a Spanish degree. It proved his character. Um, I thought about, you know, seeing his hand, his fingerprints, they were all over the situation. I was prompted to switch my major to Spanish education. I was led to Arizona to do my student teaching. During that short four month window of time, I heard about a new hearing device that I went to check out that discovered um, where I discovered my brain tumor. The apartment that I lived at uh, and the school I taught at was only a few miles away from a world renowned hospital for brain research research and surgery. Hmm. The neurosurgeon I was scheduled with was one of the hospital's best and who specialized in my rare tumor. So connecting all these dots, Oh, and I also got a call from my university. They said, I'm so sorry to hear about the situation. I, uh, we understand that you completed all the requirements two months before it was due. We had a meeting with education department about you, your situation, and it was a unanimous decision. You have passed. 
and you have officially graduated from the program. Congratulations. Huh. Acting on promptings led to more miracles unfolding. I was also relieved to find out that I was still covered under my mom's insurance being 25 and not 26 because out of pocket, the surgery would have cost over $1 million. The divine timing of it all was not a coincidence. I kept thinking, God showed his hand here, here. Why would he not? Why wouldn't that same kind God who I know come through now when I needed him most? What if my life is not falling apart, but really coming together into perfect alignment? I woke up the, sur um, the morning of surgery with adrenaline pumping throughout my entire body. My heart was pounding. My stomach was filled with butterflies as I anxiously waited to see what God was going to do. As my mom drove me to the hospital, I kept replaying in my mind. The bigger the tumor, the bigger God can show up. My gigantic tumor is not bigger than God. Um, I, I checked in to the hospital and I could sense that God was presently aware of the situation and ready to fight for me. I checked, um, I signed some consent forms and then I changed into a hospital gown in a private room. In that room, I knelt down in the cold, on the cold tile all by myself and I surrendered my life and the outcome of surgery to God's hands. I stood up, took a lot of deep breaths, walked to the surgery prep room. My neurosurgeon came in and asked if he could say a prayer over me. He um, is a believer and I was so taken back uh, by his courage and humility being a brilliant surgeon to ask for heaven's help. The anesthesiologist then came in and as he injected the syringe, the last thing I remember was praying in my mind, both hands are up, God, this is it. It's your time to show the world who you are. And then the room went dark. My mom was in the waiting room, praying her heart out. Friends and family all throughout the country were praying, waiting. After 13 hours under the knife, my neurosurgeon came to my mom in the waiting room. <clears throat> this makes me choked up just thinking about it. And he said, <clears throat> I have never experienced such smooth sailing during brain surgery before. The tumor came right out and there's no need for the predicted three days. My mom was um, so grateful. We still didn't know what complications I would have, but she was so grateful that the tumor came out that, you know, he, um, Dr. Porter said it was a miracle. And so she was t texting my sisters and, um, you know, family and friends throughout the country that were wanting to know what happened. I woke up in the ICU after the anesthesia, anesthesia wore off and uh, my nurse removed the breathing tube that I had in my throat for during the surgery. I could breathe on my own. So relieved that I didn't have one of the complications. Um, my nurse asked me to speak, no speech problems. She gave me a cracker. And although my right uh, neck muscles were paralyzed and they still are to this day, I can swallow normally, no blurry or double vision. I couldn't believe I had zero serious complications. My neurosurgeon walked in and I smiled. My right face, facial muscles were a little bit weak from the surgery. And he said, I have, I checked your facial muscles during surgery and they were very healthy and strong. As you begin to recover and regain your strength, you will be able to smile symmetrically again. He then walked around to my bedside and rubbed his fingers near my right ear. I could hear. And my hearing wasn't restored completely, but I could hear on my right side and I could not before surgery. Dr. Porter said that is a freaking miracle. I was crying and I looked towards heaven um, and my neurosurgeon shook his head. He said, I would agree. I had to learn how to rewalk uh, after intense brain surgery. That's something you have to learn how to do. After frustrating practice, uh, walking became natural again and my balance returned. I walked out of the hospital five days from surgery and my nurses and doctors, they were expecting me to be there for weeks or months, depending on my complications. As I reflected over everything that happened, you know, I flew home to Georgia to recover. And I was thinking, you know, God, he didn't forget about me that night. I cried myself to sleep when I was first diagnosed. He was aware. 
he did care. He heard my cries. He knew my pain. He, <clears throat> he was carefully guiding and protecting me for those 15 years. He was not in a hurry to rescue me, but intentionally ripened my faith through tailored experiences and aligned my circumstances in every chapter of my life so he could ultimately restore my life more abundantly. Praise God. Yes. This is beautiful. This is phenomenal. Ryan, what other thoughts do you have? Club, saltine, or Ritz? <laughs> those, those <laughs> are the uh, yeah, these are the this is the, the questions the viewers really were worried about. It's yeah. like which cracker was served. <laughs> no, I I uh and, and that's me. I joke at funerals because I get uncomfortable when there's uh, heavy moments. Uh, my personality comes out and because uh, I want to lighten the mood, but I, uh, this, you know, these are very serious things and it's, uh, but uh, the, uh, oh man, seeing like before everything happened or as things were happening and I can, I can see this in my own life. If we're not paying attention, we could, we could look at things and say, well, where are you God? you know, like is, 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 <laughs> where's my miracles? Why is this happening to me? When all along life was happening, things were happening and God was going, okay, so we need this. We need this. We need this. She needs to go to this college. So we're going to send her here. We're going to put this person in the, their, her path. He's going to go through medical school, become a world renowned surgeon. You know, like you could go back so far where all of these people that had come into your life needed to come in at that moment. So, because he knew this was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I said serendipitous or God's hand. Like, it, you know, like a lot of people could say, hey, that's coincidental. Well, wow, that's that's interesting. What are the odds of that? Right, Nick? Yeah. Surprisingly low, but surprisingly high. Dry rain. Dry rain. Yeah. Thank you, Steve Hardison, for that analogy, too. It's, it's, the, it's the, the way that you perceive it and see it. But then going backwards from it and then going, oh, my goodness, and then giving the praise back to where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. That's beautiful what you did. So thank you. Yeah. The, that tree, the tree, it just keeps mm -hmm. coming back to that. You step back from it, you zoom in on it, and you, you don't get it, right? Yeah. But you, you step back and you see the beauty of it. And you're like, your oh. mom says life happens for you. I love you, Sarah. Praise God for all the miracles in your life, the unseen and seen. I love that. Um, what are the chances, he says, 100%. That God is good. Um, what an awesome new sister we all have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think um, just to close, I think this page in your book summarizes our conversation perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's um, Rit standing on Remy, the, the giant shoulders. And so the conversation, the topic today was how to get back up when life knocks us down by intentionally changing our thoughts and feelings. And that is real tough to do by ourselves when we're feeling so low. So by standing on the shoulders of giants, or in other words, being open to learning from individuals with more life experiences and wisdom, we elevate our perspective and can then realize our own giant potential within. And there are many incredible mentors in this world. My mom has been one of mine, this awesome Facebook group, the Tribe of Giants. There are giants and mentors that I have learned from. But from my life experiences, the greatest and most influential giant who I have stood on the shoulders of is God, my creator. Beautiful. For those that have been watching, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, as always, continue to share these. Join us in the Tribe of Giants. Make it a giant day, and we will see you in the next video. Love you, too.